Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam. I am your host, Dr. Cam. And today I have with me Jessica Scott. And Jessica is a relationship coach with Alpha Women. And I love this whole concept of Alpha Women that we've talked about. And we're saying right now, we really want to help empower our girls, our teen girls. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So Jessica, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this. I am too. I, I love your message so much. And can you just start, you know, telling us about your story and how you got into this whole alpha woman coaching? All right. So um, I actually started as a fitness coach and it evolved over time, like we always do. And now I've landed on relationship coaching. Um, I'm a mother of one daughter. She's seven years old, Scarlett. And I was a single mom. I was in a relationship for 12 years and I left her dad when Scarlett was about one. And that kind of made me a little bit hardened, right? I had a lot of grief going on, a lot of anger. And at that point in my life, I mean, I was in my 30s, 32 about, um, I didn't know what to do with those emotions, right? No one ever taught me how to start to internally reflect and know what do you, what do you need? What are you even feeling? Um, it's like, I would feel something and then I'd have to go work out or go do, I didn't have any inner coping mechanisms because as much as I was a straight A student, went to the best colleges and did all the things, no one ever taught me. So if you're not teaching this in your home, they're not going to get it at school. <laughs> um, and it doesn't matter how strong of a woman you're raising. And I love that alpha woman concept because I was raised to be a very strong and independent woman. And the reason why I love talking about this is because if we raise our girls, like I was raised to be strong and independent without understanding what their needs are, they won't be able to internally reflect mm -hmm. and they won't think that it's okay to have other people help them get their needs met. Mm -hmm right? You almost become this island. And uh, if you have any tragic things happen, like becoming a single mom or even something really benign, you start to get really walled off. So I was, you know, excelling in business, excel. I, I've always excelled wherever I am, but because I wasn't, I was kind of armored, right? It's like armored alpha. I didn't have the internal narrative and no one ever um, kind of pulled that softness out of me because they were like drilling being uh, tough and strong. So there is a huge balance. And so um, being a single mom, I was very tough and very strong. You have to be right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I, I met my partner now and it, his name is Rick. And he, he, we have such a phenomenal relationship and it's everything I've ever wanted. But unbeknownst to me, his ability to lead and like be that masculine energy, so to speak, be kind of the container for me to soften a little bit and know like, I don't, you don't have to do it all by yourself. You know, it's not a badge of honor. It doesn't make you any better. And for me to be able to say, hey, I have this need and be able to share it and voice that, mm -hmm. right? So it's, we've got, we've got to teach our girls to be empowered and speak up for themselves and share how they're feeling, right? But yeah. not be so empowered that they're an island without anyone there to help them. And they're kind of cut off from what relationships and life are all about. Yeah, I love this. It's like a juxtaposition. It's finding strength in your vulnerability. And I think, you know, as a single mom myself, you do feel like you need to put on, you need to be able to do it all. And asking for help is probably one of the hardest things because you feel like it shows weakness and you don't want to show weakness. So I am just loving this whole idea of being able to be strong within that vulnerability to show that asking for help actually shows strength mm -hmm. and courage, not weakness. So right. I think this is so critical to teach our kids and our girls right now. Um, you know, particularly now, <laughs> you know, we're, we're seeing so many kids and I'm seeing so many girls struggling right now. Um, that are trying to maintain 
who they are and display strength when they're just crumbling with everything going on. And we talked a little bit too about how women are still coming out based on how they're being treated by men. And, you know, Cuomo this morning, there was more of that story. How do we teach our girls to be strong? So this is the thing that I've never understood. There's such strength in the feminine part of being a woman, right? I thought that strength was this like brute force. And this is where the working out, I mean, I, I actually had an eating disorder. I struggled with mm -hmm. disordered eating because the strength, I was like a tractor beat. Like it was like, took me in. And I thought that that strength, that like, unbendable focused will was going to be my ticket to happiness mm -hmm. but really what it did was arrested me into this straitjacket where I couldn't feel or access what it was about me that made me soft or a woman or nurturing or warm right and these are all these qualities that as a woman it, it makes you well-rounded right yeah um I was trying to be a guy so much I actually started to look like one. I had eight mm. pack shredded abs. I had the perfect Instagram body. And after I did that and got there, um, I, I was, I don't know if teens are watching this, but I was standing in the mirror with no clothes on looking at myself with eight pack abs. I had no body fat. And I was like, now what? Like this, what, this wasn't it. It literally yeah. was not it. I was not any happier. And so that's when my internal journey started. And I started to know, know and have to experience what is it like to feel my feelings what is it like mm -hmm. to know what I need how do I do that and that was that softness and I thought that being strong like an oak or like a giant sequoia was where the answer was but in reality when a storm comes those trees usually break right mm -hmm. it's the bendable it's your ability to be malleable and persevere and you can't do that by ignoring what's truly going on inside. So in this really difficult time that we've been going through, um, especially for, I can't imagine how hard it is for young teens, yeah. um, cause it's been difficult for me even too, as an adult, it, we really have to give them the tools to be able to have this narrative and mirror for them what's going on. And even it's so helpful if they're going through a difficult time, normalize it. Right. I thought mm -hmm. that if I got straight A's, was the captain of my volleyball team, got my scholarship to college, all of these things I did. I graduated from the University of Chicago. It's the number two or three ranked school in the world. I literally thought that that was the recipe to success, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Right. These things are necessary, but no one ever taught me how to know what's going on internally and to really start to create my life. And you need to have a parent there mirroring for that. Yeah, and I think you bring up such a great point too, because as parents, um, and I see this a lot too, it's very hard to focus, like we get very focused on the outward appearance of being successful and healthy, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we put so much um, weight on grades to measure how well our kids are doing in school. We put a lot of weight on performance to measure how good and as successful our kids are and how they appear. And we're missing, like you're saying, we're missing this internal piece that is the key, it is right? So that is the key. And I think we're uncomfortable doing that. We're often afraid of what we're gonna find. And what you're saying is when we dig in and even if we find which we're going to find that vulnerability that hurt that pain to normalize it to make sure it's okay right I, I literally thought and no one ever overtly told me this but I thought that if I got the good grades I got the job I went to the college I was the captain of the team started all that I literally thought that was the key to success like that was what it was going and so then when I graduated from college I was like, what the heck is this? Yeah. What, what do I do? I didn't have the skill set because even if you land the best job, you get the best guy, you have the best house, you've got the best whatever, and you're 
cooking with gas and you've got everything going on, crap is going to happen, <laughs> right? Yeah. Something is going to come up. So if we give our children all of these things to set them up for, up for success, we do the swimming lessons, we do this and do that. We've got all those things going on. What happens when something goes wrong and they don't have the skill set mm -hmm. to navigate? That mm -hmm. was that was me. I literally was arrested with, I'm like, uh, and then I had almost zero critical thinking skills mm -hmm. because I was so book smart. I mean, I got straight A's. I had a 4.0 GPA. I had, I, I was given academic scholarships and then I was given athletic scholarships. I didn't even use the athletic scholarships because I had academic scholarships instead, which is so great. But when you get out of school and you're like, what are the rules? What does the syllabus say? There's no syllabus. So I was, I, I literally had on paper, I looked amazing internally. I had almost nothing because they don't teach this in school. They don't, they don't teach it. And we don't always teach it at home because we're not thinking that. I think we get very focused on all the things you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's not giving them the tools and the resilience they need for all the crap that's going to happen, right? So mm -hmm. how do we, you know, you're talking about modeling. And I think this is often hard when we're not able to do it ourselves because we were raised how the way you were describing. So Boy. a lot of us adults don't have those skills either. And we're kind of winging it. So how do we help empower? I mean, this is girl, we're talking girls. This is boys too. I think this totally. is just as equal to them, but how do we empower them with these skills that we're talking about right now? Yeah, so the first is, the thing is to invite compassion in because mm -hmm. all the things that we don't know, right? It's just because no one ever taught us. It's not that we're doing a bad job. It's not that you're messed up. Um, you know, I, I believe everyone is doing their best. So first invite compassion in. Um, second, I have looked at raising Scarlet as kind of a customized curriculum for growth for myself. Mm. So it's not that I don't have the tools and I don't know and more self-depreciating thoughts and beliefs, right? But instead it's, wow, I, I don't know. I've never parented a seven-year-old mm -hmm. before. I don't, right. I don't know. And so usually what the struggles we go through with our children highlight for us where we've stopped emotionally and maturing as adults. And so instead of using it as an aggravation, which of course we get aggravated. I mean, mm -hmm. last night, I, you know, my cycle is about to start. I was like, I am on E. I was depleted, right? Yeah. So the family knew. Um, but to use it as saying, in, instead of a self-depreciating thought, to really use it as, oh, wow, you know, how do I handle this in a more mm -hmm. conscious or constructive way? Um, how do I ask Scarlett? Um, you know, she had a big blowout at Sephora a few months back. And I've realized now she gets overwhelmed with decisions. She cannot mm -hmm. with decisions. You know, we went there. I said, you can pick out a, a piece of makeup or whatever. Um, that was really overwhelming. Sephora has about 50 a lot of choices, right? yeah. And so even in that moment, I noticed she was erupting. I was starting to get anxious in the store. Um, I have anxiety anyway. And so I started talking like crazy and trying to navigate with her. We had to leave the store and I was, I was not happy. Um, but I kept quiet when we were driving home. Then I said, Hey, I noticed in the store, you were really starting to get to a really intense place. What could I do better in that moment to help you? This, and this is just saying, I don't know, right? Like, I wish that my parents would have modeled, hey, I'm a human and I'm learning and I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I'm here to guide you. You're not guiding me. It's not role reversal. But, you know, what, what would you need in that moment? I want my partner to say that too. Yeah. Rick doesn't always know whether this is, you know, intimacy, relationship. He doesn't know. So if he were to ask and I can reflect, what do I, what do I need? And so I've started having these conversations with Scarlett in that moment. She goes, you were talking so much if you just stop talking. And my anxiety was like, navigate you over here. Do you want this lipstick or we could get this? You know, that was what I was doing. That was my coping mechanism to try to control the situation. And I, instead of going, you won't talk to me like that. I'll talk to you, right? Instead, I said, oh, wow. That was really overwhelming for her system. And thank God she has the capacity to know that. And now she's going to tell me. 
Yeah. Now I'm starting to learn how to parent her. You know, an authoritarian style parenting is instead of being attuned to your child, your, you know, it doesn't matter if it's your kid, her kid, this kid in front of me, I'm doing it all the same. Mm -hmm. We don't always want to be loved the same. You know, you have different needs as a woman in a relationship from me. And so the more we can not lower ourselves down, but just get on our kids level, right? What do you need? Now I know when she starts to freak out, if I'm freaking out and talking too much, it's going to be World War III in there. Yeah. And so anything we can do to get our children to internally reflect, remember the first time my sister and I both started going to therapy years ago, not together, but at the same time. I was raising Scarlett by myself. Mm -hmm. And so I was really overwhelmed as a mom one time. And my sister said, what do you need? As I was, you know, kind of venting on a text message. She just said, what do you need? Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I don't know. No one's asked me that in 32 years. Right. And so um, I do something with Scarlett called emotion coaching. And this is from the Gottman Institute. Mm. And it's step one is to witness the emotion in her, right? So whether she's angry or, you know, frustrated or yelling, I just witness the emotion. And I put a little caveat in there. This isn't part of Gottman steps, but I say, and not only do I witness about the emotion, I witness my own judgments about the emotion, mm. right? Okay. Oh, there she is getting angry again. Right. Like I was just literally like chopping vegetables. She got angry and now I'm all like, what is that? Why can't I stay regulated and not mm-hmm. absorb? I can just witness. Right. So my reaction to her anger or her thing in Sephora that's going on tells me a lot about how I handle my own emotions internally. Yeah. If I'm like, you will not get angry. It's like, what is so wrong about anger? Anger is yeah. so helpful we need anger to be able to tell us when a boundary has been violated. So I let Scarlett get angry. Yeah. I let her mm-hmm. punch a pillow or scream into pillows because you know what, if she's not able to express anger in this house, someday she's going to be 16 or 20 and she's not going to be able to say to a guy, Hey, I don't like that. Yeah. I, that was a boundary violation. That is an absolute no from me. Mm-hmm. So we can't silence our children and expect them to not self silence later. All right, that's good. So that first step is to witness that emotion. The second step is to use happy emotion for a time for connection, right? Usually it's like, get over there. I can't with you. You know, we could have just yelled at each other in the car and like, don't talk to me on the way home from Sephora. But instead I calm down, use it for a time for connection. Mm -hmm. I was really intense back there. I'm sorry we had to leave. What could I have done different in that moment? Because that was really, really intense for both of us right? So I'm using it as a time to connect instead of disconnect. When we do this, when our kids are growing up, it's helpful because then when they're, you know, having those big emotions, they're not expected to do it in their room alone, right? Yes. I used to cry in my room alone. One of the questions that I asked my clients, I'm like, who came when you were going through heavy emotion? Most of them are like, no one, no one ever came, right? And so we need to know that we don't have to always be alone. Go to your kids. So then your third one is help them name the emotion. You would not believe how many adults that I work with. And these are successful, you know, like really killer women who are accomplished and have so much going on. They'll tell me something that's going on in their life. And then I say, how did that make you feel? Um, How does that feel for you? Oh, well, he's just a jerk. And I can't even believe that. How did that make you feel? Right? They're like, well, he's just a, and I had to go pick up the kids and I, and I'm like, how did that make you feel? Right. And so it just, it's, it's rampant. And so after we get, I get Scarlett and she, we've been doing this for years. I mean, it started, I would be like, you know, you're pretty frustrated. And then she'll, she'd be sitting with like a phone cord or whatever near her. And sometimes she wouldn't verbalize it, but she's like, "Mm -mm." I'm like, you're not frustrated. And I'm like, what are you? And then she'd take the phone cord and do like a sad face like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I just want her to have this language. Right. So she, Mm -hmm. she said it and she knows how to do this already. So then after we name the um, emotion, we allow them to feel it without trying to change it, make them laugh. Oh, Hey, look over here. Right. Um, this emotions aren't bad. It's not the problem. It's that we don't know how to deal with them. And so then I always say, if you could think of one thing that would maybe make you feel a little bit better, what do you think that would be? 
this gets them in like when she's 25 in her own apartment sometime and if i'm on this earth hopefully i'll be there to help her through it but if i'm not i want her to be able to say gosh i'm really sad i don't have to you know distance myself from myself or think that I'm terrible for being sad. I'm sad. My mom taught me that this is a very real emotion. She even taught me that sometimes she gets sad. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm 25. What do I need? If I could think of one thing that doesn't harm myself, yeah. that, you know, it's not drinking, it's whatever. How could I hold myself with this emotion and just take care of myself? Gosh, this is really hard right now. You know, how would I, this is reparenting. How would I reparent my you know, the little girl that lives inside me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much great stuff right there. Like just <laughs> a ton of it. Um, I, you know, and there was just a few, I, I'm going to have to like out, we'll outline and do the transcript because I think there's so much great things in there. And then like one thing that really kind of resonated to and pulled out is so many parents just go, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And you just gave them permission to ask. Yeah. There's no, there, there, there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you don't know what to say, rather yeah. than trying to make it up or ignore it or get angry, simply ask. And that's not undermining your authority. It's actually showing yeah. your authority. I mean, imagine if your husband did that. Like, gosh, this is so foreign to me. And, you know, what, what do you need right now? I'm here for you. Instead of him just going outside to the tool shed and being like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. So yeah. you can just deal with it, right? And so much of when people avoid, we read it as rejection. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh, they don't want to be around me. What's wrong with me? There's something. And so the message we send when we don't ask and we just kind of try to avoid is actually adding to right. the issue rather than helping the issue. So right. I just want people to sit with a second with that and say, it is actually really helpful to not know and ask the person. Yeah. And everybody's different. So every child is different of what they need and to be able to understand what they need and what that communicates to the kid is, I care. You right. care enough to ask and want to help. And wow, that's powerful. Totally. And, and that with that too, not just asking, which is such an important part, but I like, we call this in, you know, the coaching industry or coaching world is learning how to hold space. Mm -hmm. So, so, and what holding space means is, you know, I might not know what to do. I might not know what to say, and I might be in my own feelings about that, but can I just sit with you in the uncomfortability of it all and just say, this sucks. Yes. it really does it's it does suck that he just broke up with you it does suck that you don't get to go to school right instead of like well at least at least is like the most oh, yeah. empathetic thing you could say right but just to learn how to sit with it one of, my, one of my best friends is a therapist and so we obviously have such a phenomenal nourishing relationship but one of the things when we first started being friends that she taught me I was going through some health issues and whenever I would share, because I have thyroid issues and it was really, really challenging, instead of her saying, well, at least, or, you know, negating everything I was saying, I get it. It's, really, it's been really hard for you, hasn't it? This is just mirroring. This is just not trying Validating. to fix it. You know, you're just, I, when someone feels heard and seen, you might not even know what to do or have to fix it or have the, the tools. When someone feels seen and heard, it's half the healing mm -hmm. because they don't feel like what they're going through or feeling is the wrong part. So instead of having their like pitchfork up and like, I'm going to defend that this is, I'm, I'm able to feel this way, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine like as a woman, your friend or your husband comes in and just goes, it has been really hard, hasn't it? Doesn't that just, it's not like they said anything, you know? whether you have a Nobel Peace Prize, but like they just were holding space. And so if you don't know anything else, if you don't know what to do, if anything, anyone in your life is going through a difficult time, work on being able to hold space. And our ability to hold space is inextricably linked to our ability to hold space for ourselves. Mm. That, is, that is so essential. And being able to validate what they're feeling rather than judging what they're feeling too because i think as parents 
we perceive a lot of their different emotions as defiance or disrespect or laziness or like all of these things that then trigger us because we're thinking oh they're they're not seeing us as an authority figure they don't can't treat us can't treat me this way rather than going why do they feel the need to act out that way what's going on because yeah. the more they act out the more hurt they are inside and when we just throw more shame onto it and hurt onto it and anger onto it all that's doing is making that grow it's not helping them heal totally yeah and i i think of it this way we all have like a car dashboard right we're driving along if me you and i were in the car and you were behind the wheel if the gas light goes on what are you going to do you're going to probably be like hey we were on our way to starbucks but we're going to go get gas real quick because if i don't the car is going to stop moving yeah. It doesn't matter if you put a little sticky over it. It doesn't matter if we crank the music up. It doesn't matter if we do anything. The car has a need for mm -hmm. gas. And if that need doesn't get met, the car will stop moving, right? And so all emotions either mean, like if I'm happy and excited and all things, everything's great, it's been so warm out here lately, then my needs are met right? So this is great. When a child or an adult or any human is having heavy emotion, instead of going, oh God, there they go again. What we need to be flipping the switch and going internally and going, whoa, anger, unmet need, yeah. you know, defiance, unmet need, mm -hmm. crying, mm -hmm. unmet mm -hmm. need right? Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like a car. If we were driving along, you go this damn car and it's stupid gas tank. <laughs> and then you shake oh, yeah. the, it. Yeah. Right. And I'd be like, <laughs> okay, you can have your own response to it, but that's not filling the car's need. You're not going to get it back to neutral by shaking the steering wheel. The only thing that gets it back to neutral is filling it with gas. Oh, that is great. That I've heard the filling it up again, I haven't heard it said exactly that way. What an amazing, clear, clear analogy of that is that's the only thing you can do. And no matter how you yes. ignore it or what else you do, if yeah. you're not dealing with the actual issue, right. it's not going to resolve itself. Then you're and too much time going on. You know, I didn't deal with the actual issue. I got an eating disorder. Yeah. Right? So yes. we will choose a coping mechanism mm -hmm. to deal with the pain like drinking, drugs, what have yeah. you, abuse, um, depression, and all that, if we don't learn how to hold pain. So we're not trying to keep and shield our children from pain. Pain is a part of life. When pain comes, I want to teach you this is what you do. Mm -hmm. So it's an inevitable part of life. It's when I'm not trying to shield you, I'm trying to give you the tools oh man, I'm feeling, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm getting my cycle soon. So I've been just feeling a little depleted. So I'm like, what do I need right now? We're not robots. Mm -hmm. And I love yeah. talking about women because we have cycles in the month and it even exacerbates this. <laughs> exactly. Especially when everyone in the house is doing yeah. it at the same time. So totally. before we go, I know a lot of women that could use your I'm not saying that they need it. I know they've asked me for people that can help them, right? So how do they find you? How do they work well, with you? Yeah, um, I have my two social media accounts. One is Instagram, one's Facebook. Uh, it's Jessica Scott on both of those. I also have a free Facebook group community that I run. Mm. It's called um, the Alpha Woman Society. Society is spelled with an E. I tried to do it a little fancy. <laughs> um, and then it, it's relationship coaching for the alpha woman in there, even if you're not thinking I need relationship coaching or my relationship's falling apart or whatever. What I love about relationship coaching is, first of all, we can't ever get away from relationships, right? They literally are the glue of everything. We're not meant mm -hmm. to live alone. If someone's living by themselves and hasn't contacted a human in years, they're probably a little bit off, right? So even if you're not in peril in your relationship or you're mm -hmm. single and you're not starting to date or whatever, relationships and knowing how to connect and nourish and do what relationships are it is so edifying to you and everyone in your in your life so yeah. alpha woman relationship coaching i go live in there once a week um nice. it's such a great community and um I, I just started it a few weeks ago and it's really great to be around other strong women that are also learning this work 
I love it. I'm going to go join too, because even a relationship with yourself, we need to focus yeah. on, right? Too. Yeah. So there's so much in that. And that's so what Jessica, Ultra is. <laughs> I know, right? So Jessica, thank you so much. So, so much for coming on. So many oh. great tips and things that I think people can go back and just start processing and thinking about and just said in a way that is unique and different, which I appreciate too, because I think yeah. sometimes it takes us many different ways to hear the same thing sure. for it to sink in. So I really, really value what you've had to add. Awesome. And I feel like we could just talk for hours. We really could. And we'll have to get you back on the power hour. So um, we've got the power hour, which is going every first and third Tuesday of the month where we just dig in a lot deeper on this and let people it. ask questions. So we'll have to there. get you on. And if people are interested in that, it's just ask Dr. Cam slash power hour and you can find out about it. So I just want to thank the parents, all the parents that have jumped on out of your busy day. I appreciate you coming on and I want to wish you a happy, peaceful, calm day.